So welcome everybody. Today we have a really special show. I've been really looking forward to this interview. It is the 10 year anniversary of um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's um, death and we're here celebrating her and her work. And uh, we're here talking about her book on death and dying and we have two very special guests. We have her son, uh, welcome Ken, who's here. And uh, we also have um, Diane Gray, who is the head of the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Foundation. So Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. So how does it feel now? It's 10 years past her, your mother's passing. It feels good to me. I mean, people like, you know, are always saying, oh, oh, I'm so sorry about your mother. But, you know, my mom really felt like she had done her work. And, you know, the last nine years of her life were kind of tough because she was partially paralyzed. Oh, wow. And so she was ready to go. And her death was no big deal. She's like, well, that's a big deal. <laughs> So she was totally, you know, excited and looking forward to it. Yeah. Not as like in a passive way, but just as she had done her work and she's ready to kind of take off to the, the galaxy. What was happening in the last nine years of her life? Uh, she had a number of strokes, TIAs, small strokes. Mm -hmm. uh, she really didn't believe in taking care of herself. She just wanted to have fun. And so, you know, she would smoke and eat naughty and be naughty. And, you know, she just wanted to have fun and she couldn't have as much fun. So uh, she was just ready to take off. The five stages of uh, grief or okay. death, they're the same, right? Whether it's grief or death? Yes. I mean, originally Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, you know, in the late 60s, interviewed hundreds of dying people at the University of Chicago Hospital. So originally she created, you know, um, work based on these hundreds of interviews with dying patients. And then years later, you know, people asked her and said, well, wouldn't it be applicable? And, and I think eventually she came to understand that, you know, grieving patients also, um, you know, felt very similar things to what dying patients did in terms of the five stages or these phases or these normalization of emotions, as she came to say. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're applicable, but, I, but the original intent of the work was based on dying patients. Mm. You know, the five stages, um, which were from, from reading a book on death and dying, were denial and isolation, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Um, would you say those are still the same five stages? And uh, have they changed over time as, as this body of work has developed over time? There's been great debate over it for the last 45 years. Uh, if you take a look in the book, actually, well, people focus on the five stages. My mother actually discussed more than five stages. Uh, for example, hope is never discussed when you mention the five stages, but that was, if you see the chart, there's hope is one of the stages, and yet it's right. never mentioned. There's also preparatory grief. There's all sorts of things that are never mentioned with the five stages. So it's kind of fascinating to see the way it's taken on a life of its own, but it's not completely correct. Yeah, it, it's very interesting to me. So if you, as Ken mentions, if you look at the book, you know, on death and dying or anything that talks about the five stages, You'll see at the top of Elizabeth's original chart, hope runs across the entire <laughs> spectrum. But yeah. I think what's really important about that is, and I think that the reason it's not a stage, because it isn't a stage, is that it's pervasive. Mm. It's pervasive in everyone. And when you read Elizabeth's book, clearly, and you start really researching her work, you'll see that hope is as much a part of every living person's being and it's only, she, she did great research and work on the fact that it's only when you would see that they would let go of hope that they would actually die. Mm. So, and hope, it, yeah, interesting. So it's not considered a stage, but kind of a, a presence. Of yeah, a state of being uh, and presence that you need to have throughout that in order to feel like you're living. Exactly. And, and every person has it. Even in Viktor Frankl's work, Man's Search for Meaning, mm -hmm. he, he found that every living person who had a, a sense of meaningfulness and purpose also had hope. Mm -hmm. And that's you know, an interesting cross-section uh, of the work between these two iconic beings. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so um, one of the things, I've, there's so much now re written about your mother's work, and it seems like... Uh, you know, some people say that you, you know, in, in the book there's a diagram in here and then it kind of displays it as sequentially, but there's overlaps. Do people experience these five, five stages generally in sequence? 
out do they feel do they do they experience them at a sequence or how do people experience them in practice um, elizabeth's work was very very clear and this is my favorite question and i'm so glad you <laughs> gave Ken and I both the opportunity to clear up yet again yeah, the confusion. <laughs> yeah, right? This misperception, which is, for the record, not all people go through all of the stages. Not all people go through the stages all sequentially. Elizabeth was very clear in her work. People are not robots, and mm -hmm. each person experiences grief and end of life as unique as their DNA. So some of the people go through some of the stages, none of the stages, all of the stages, they go forward, they go backward. You might go uh, out of anger and then months later go back to anger because you're still angry about something else. Mm -hmm. It's not a linear, um, strict rule book for what anyone should experience. Mm -hmm. um, you know. So many people look at this work and they say, oh, I'm in the ex, they'll stop me in an airport. Yeah. <laughs> or they'll say, oh, I heard you're that, you know, you work with the Cooper Ross Foundation. And yeah. I'll say, I'm very proud to, yes. And they'll say, okay, so I'm in the depression stage. <laughs> I'm waiting for this, like, epic moment, the thunderstorm to... <laughs> yeah, exactly. ...to the next thing, like, when will I experience acceptance, Diane? And that's just not the way. And Elizabeth was very clear. There's no, this is set as a, she wrote these five stages as a guideline so that people would, A, understand and normalize their experience with grief and end of life. Mm -hmm. And also, too, Ken, you can add to this, and I would love to hear what you have to say. Didn't your mom at some point say, ah, you know, the five stages, I, you know, right? Uh, even back as early as 1973, she said, let's get past the stages, you know, the book is a reflection on conversations I've had with dying, mm -hmm. and she really just wanted to get the conversation started, because nobody was talking about death in America, and mm -hmm. people were dying very badly. Mm -hmm. Well, did it, how did these five stages come about then? It seemed like she had themes, like when I'm, I'm reading the book, it seemed like probably she noticed themes that were emerging at the time of a person's death. Is that a better way of thinking about it, instead of these five stages? Well, uh, she actually thought that On Death and Dying was like not just about the five stages. She thought the main lesson of the book was actually listening to a patient mm. because she found that universally people were not being listened to when they're dying. Mm -hmm. They weren't even being told they were dying. Mm -hmm. it, it, exactly. And they, as Ken said, they were not given their prognosis. You know, in Elizabeth's research um, and when she was at the University of Chicago Hospital, she would go on numerous floors, you know, looking for a dying patient. Uh, and she was told, we have no dying patients here. And she said, you know what, in a 600-bed hospital, yeah. no dying patients. Right. This is ridiculous. Yeah. And, and as Ken so beautifully pointed out, his mom's work was as much about listening. It was also about the pervasiveness of hope. It was about um, compassion for the dying and that they had a right. It is a very basic human right to know their prognosis. And we still see that today, that there are physicians and clinicians who are mortified at, um, no pun intended, at, uh, <laughs> at, at sharing the prognosis for a patient. It's, mm. it's tragic. That's shocking to me. So are you saying that they don't share the prognosis of the patient or they eventually do even though it's hard? I'm saying there's no hard and fast rule for all, for all doctors all of the time. Oh, Some yeah. doctors, you know, communication is a very, you know, it's, it's, it's iffy. Sometimes, you know, anybody that's been in a relationship knows that they've turned to their partner and sometime and said, I told you, blah, 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 right? right. Right. And the other person sits there like, oh, no you didn't, what did you say? Well, sometimes doctors feel that they told their patient, you know, mm. the cold hard facts, I think you have this long to live, and the patient leaves the room, and all they saw were the doctor's lips moving, but they never really mm. grasped. So it's not just the fault of the physician or clinician. Sometimes the patient zones out, or sometimes the clinician thinks he's being clear, but he's he or she is not. It, it's a it's a tough thing. Mm. 
Kim, what do you think enabled your mom to actually listen? Because I've, I've seen videotapes of her, and she's really listened. She's present. She's listening. And there's no kind of, huh, you know, most of us talk about death, and there's all this nervousness. And all. What do you think enabled her to do that? Well, I think my mother grew up in, in the countryside in Switzerland, and there, death, you know, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, death was a part of village life. I mean, she was exposed to death as she saw the concentration camps, you know, she'd go to the homes of people who were dying, and she was very much, it was, you know, a very matter-of-fact thing to die in rural Switzerland, or, you know, in many places. But in America, because of technology, death had become removed from the families, and when you're removed from something, it becomes a stranger, and you begin to fear it. Whereas my mother was, you know, a country doctor, and she saw she would help people die at home. You know, death was just a natural part of life. Mm. So you, 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 were, you were raised in the countryside, correct? Because you were raised in California? Well, I was raised right? in New York and Chicago. So. Okay, <laughs> so you're far from the countryside. How did she instill upon you, you know, you weren't in the countryside. Death is, you know, you're part of this world in which technology estranges us from this whole concept of death. How did your mother introduce you to some of these ideas about death and dying? Uh, well, growing up, you know, my mother would take me along to lectures and workshops, and so I would meet dying people growing up when I was, you know, 10, 12, 14. I'd meet people even who are my age, mm -hmm. who had six weeks to live. Oh, wow. Uh, our uncle died in our house, and instead of my mother kind of hiding it, she invited us in to see his body and sit with him and, you know, and see that as a natural thing. Mm. That's nothing to fear. It was very much part of our growing up. Okay, well, most of us don't... <laughs> I don't know if I want to take my kids to, to, to the hospital, but I guess why not? I mean, in some way, she, there's a film in which she said, I think the most wonderful thing that would happen would be to have the youngsters actually be sitting in the senior citizen's house, and you know, to help, because both of them would help each other. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Well, I'm going to be therapy later. <laughs> <laughs> Diane, what do you think are some of the conversations? Because you also have a daughter, I mean, and you had a son that went through, you know, for 12 years of illness and he died as a teenager. I mean, what were the conversations that you had with your kids? You know, I think that the great thing about kids and the horrifying thing at the same time is they ask these questions and you yeah. never know where they're coming from. You never know when these questions will occur. Yeah. They sort of just throw them at you mm -hmm. and you better be ready, you know, or, so I think in, in my kid's case, uh, my son was diagnosed with a rare neurodegenerative brain disorder when he was four, almost five years old, and um, from day one, you know, I, I think it was really about, I love you, uh, I will not leave you, I will always be by your side, uh, we will do the best we can, and the doctors will do everything they can, and let's live a little what you know I, I think it's a gift to know that someone you love has a rare disease or has a terminal disease um, and subsequently through Elizabeth's work though I also came to learn this very very important fact is we all are gonna die of something so really this would be applicable and that it's that live a little you know yeah. So it was kind of, you know, rubber stamped onto my forehead. You have this much time, supposedly. You know, and the doctors kept saying, oh, you have two years until he dies. Well, you better start, you know, you start living and you start thinking, okay. So he wants ice cream for breakfast. You know, not every day, but if he wants to have a couple spoonfuls of ice cream, yes, so what? And Elizabeth was like that at the end of her life, right, Ken? And at, with her, at the end of her father's life, you know, she said, what, he wants chocolate and he wants a little drink. Or Elizabeth said, I want to smoke. You know, in, in the case of my kids, when they would ask questions, it was always about, um, they were never hard, fast, well, how long does he have to live? Mm -hmm. He wanted to know things like, Christina asked one time, is God in a wheelchair? <laughs> you know, what does one say when a three-year-old asks that question? Except, of course, he is. Yeah. The spirit of God is in the creation of things that make life easier for people who are seriously ill. Yeah. True or false. Wow. True or false. But the thing I, t I found, too, with kids 
yeah, and also too with adults, it's imperative to speak the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, Elizabeth would say, no phony baloney, you know? You have to really speak and be the truth because people can see through it, mm -hmm. always. What were the conversations, Ken, that your mom had with you? And I know, I know she dragged you to all these different places. And right. You saw these, you know, probably awakening moments where you saw people at their death and kind of experienced some things that probably none of us will ever experience in our lifetime. What were the conversations that she had about life or death or anything that really shaped who you are now? Uh, you know, oddly enough, my mother and I have never discussed her work. I think because yeah. my mother needs some kind of relief from dealing with dying people all day long. You know, when it came to her family, she just wanted to be a mom. Mm. And she wanted to shut down the doctor and the death and dying and the lecturing and the teaching. And she just wanted to be a normal mom. Mm. And so when my mom and I were together with my sister, dad, whatever, it was always about my mother cooking. Let's <laughs> go have fun. Let's enjoy life. So the family is like life and living and, you know, let's get away from the work and that, just enjoy things. That's interesting. And I've been teaching all day. I've been meeting dying children all day. Let's just have fun and cook and make candles and do hobbies and go ride our bikes and things like that. Yeah. So we first never discussed her work. Yeah. The only way she taught me about her work was by taking me with her on these trips mm. where I got to see her lecture. Mm. Mm. So how so is that? How has it... So, I mean, you've seen, you're clearly familiar with her work. You actually experienced some of what she may have experienced, but yet you didn't, she didn't bring that at home. How do you now think about death and dying? Well, like her, like, you know, I think the dying have taught me to go out and really enjoy life and live it fully. Mm -hmm. So I picked my dream job very early on, and I've been a travel photographer, and I photographed 92 countries, mm -hmm. you know, so that's really like a dream life. I thought very early. How am I going to spend this finite amount of time I have? Mm -hmm. You know, I've got to really pack it in and have a lot of fun. Right. People kept saying, oh, Ken, you've got to settle down. You can't keep doing this. I'm like, oh, yeah, life is short. I, I'm going to keep doing this <laughs> until I drop. <laughs> yeah, so it's about, and, the, and Diane, you had talked to me about this earlier. It's about living fully. And, and you had said this about your son, too, that when he, you, he knew that he had two years left, it's like, okay, well, let's just... You know, eat ice cream, do whatever you want. You know, let's live it up because we have two years left. How did it affect you after your son passed? How did it affect your actual life? Well, I got a great question from an interviewer the other day. And he said, do I have any regrets? You know, so we found out that Austin was terminally ill when he was, you know, four turning five. And they said, you only have two years. Well, that two years was not true. It turned out we had ten years. Wow. But like Ken just said, we lived with the pedal to the metal. And that doesn't mean always going, going, going. What that meant was in, in contemporary language, that means living a life of mindfulness, mm -hmm. being fully present in the moment with my kids and with whoever was around and whatever we were doing, whether it was, as Ken said, arts and crafts or walking across, trudging across a waterfall or right. whatever. It meant being singularly in that moment and breathing and drinking every bit of life in in that moment. Mm -hmm. So the interviewer asked me, did I have any regrets? And I said, no. We lived more fully in those 14 years than so many people I know because other people sometimes think, eh, you know, next year I'll sit down with the kids and make that art project or eh, next year I'll play baseball with them in the park. I had the gift of knowing, and it's really embedded in my being now, that life is short. Yeah. Life could be, you know, over tomorrow or in a car accident or a terminal illness. You don't need to, you know, have the diagnosis to really get it that you better live now. Yeah. Well, I was wondering when you're saying that, so I wondered... To what extent is our fear of death actually not allowing us to live? Because you actually had to confront a real death. You know, it's like, well, I think we're always fearful of death, which is why we don't necessarily live. So I wonder that when you actually found out that, well, yeah, um, someone I love is going to die, that you thought, well, now we have to live. Do you, uh, do, does that make sense? Yeah, totally. But I'll tell you, in, in my case, um, my dad died when I was nine of a heart attack. He was 39 years old. 
So very early on, I think um, I learned that key message of life is short. Mm -hmm. But I think that that lesson doesn't, you don't have to have a death in order to learn that. I think if we teach our kids to the best of our ability, mm -hmm. right? When they're tiny, tiny tots, that hey, let's, you know what, let's push back the furniture and have a dance party. Right. Or let me just sit with you and get off of Facebook or Twitter, which is a joke because I actually do a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if we can just be fully present with those people that we love when we are with them, I don't think you have to have a person die in order to learn that lesson, that life lesson. Yeah. I don't. Yeah, I think that that's true. I think, and, and, it's, and it's kind of this weird, perverse thing, but, you know, my dad died of a heart attack, and it really did teach me to live. But I, I don't think that you have to, but I have to say, having experienced that, I did learn to live after his death. I, I don't yeah. know how to, I mean, I wish it didn't have to be that case, um, and I don't think it has to be. Um, right. But it certainly helps when that does happen. I mean, if, it, if, it is, if that is even the right choice of words, I don't know. No, totally. Okay, so let's talk about conversations. Conversations that um, I think are important uh, to have with your family members. Um, you know, once they, let, let's say they actually get prognosed with something that may be a terminal illness. Um, what are the conversations that are important to have with your family members during the prognosis, when they're having a hard time, when they may be even facing death? What are the important conversations you think would be helpful for that person and for yourself? Well, the, Dr. Ira Bayak wrote a great book, and um, in it he discussed, well, he's written several great books, but one of them discusses, you know, four, four things that we can say to our loved ones. You know, thank you, I, I love you. I, I'm sorry, you know, they talk about forgiveness. So I, I think it's important to really look the person that you love, regardless of whether they're dying or not, but say thank you for being in my life. Mm. Thank you for, you know, the time that we've spent together. It's a gift and a blessing. As well, I love you. Tell the people that you love that you love them. Mm. I forgive you, meaning I forgive you for the things that you did that hurt me and also to ask for forgiveness but also hopefully to the person on the other side asks for forgiveness as well. So I think that's one thing but I think too as Elizabeth Kubler-Ross taught us it's really really important to listen. Mm. Well, what can I do for you? Mm. What's important to you? whoever the patient is or the, or the you know, dying family member or friend. Mm -hmm. what, what can I do to help you achieve or be who you would like to be in these next months or years? Mm -hmm. And then listen, say nothing, nothing. Mm -hmm. And that, sometimes the research shows 18 seconds or more. And that is hard work, man. Just <laughs> to <laughs> say nothing for 18 seconds or more. <laughs> That, I see. You had 18 seconds of dead air time here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be really hard. So you're saying ask the question and then wait, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it, and then see what the answers are. And and you know, it's it's one of the things that I found so interesting about this book on death and dying when I was reading it is it seemed like. It's an opportunity to resolve whatever is unresolved, whether it was, you know, anger at your mom for not acknowledging you because you're the black sheep of the family or guilt because you never treated someone, some of them, you know, your child died and you weren't there for them. You know, whatever it was, it seems like it seems like that time of death is a time to reconcile things if you have someone to talk to. But if you don't, you know, what happens? I don't know. Was that that's at least my impression when I read this, but I've never talked to anyone who's dying. So I don't know. Well, Try it sometime. It's enlightening. It really is. Um, yeah. So based on what Elizabeth was talking about in the book, she's talking about unfinished business. Mm -hmm. And unfinished business means that we each have things that we know in the dark recesses of our heart we need to do. We need to kind of settle the score with in a, in a loving way, meaning, you know, talking to that parent, right. which has pushed your buttons to the end and saying, you know, I realize my role in this too, or let's set this aside. In the grand scheme, you know, whatever it is, what it's conflict resolution for some people. For some people, it's doing something, an act 
of kindness or an act of service mm -hmm. for other people. It is saying, let's agree to disagree because we want a, I, I want to die peacefully. Mm -hmm. But one of the most important factors in end of life is to address your unfinished business, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So when you're asking the question, what is it that you need, perhaps it's also, you know, I don't know how you ask, like, what's your unsettled business? <laughs> that, just that way. Just that really? you just... Exactly. Yeah, you, you know, CJ, when you know, if you, if you know that you have a finite amount of time left on the earth, it really makes a lot of that, you know, blathering unnecessary. Mm -hmm. Because... Who knows if it's going to be, I mean, the doctor can guess that it's two years or six weeks, but it literally could be 10 seconds. Mm. So what, so you let yeah, love, yeah. you let love lead, you let your heart lead and you say, Hey, I'm not going to waste six minutes of this person's precious airtime left on the earth blathering about the grocery list. Right. What's, what's most important? <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Interesting. So, so kind of getting a sense of what they need, trying to figure out their unfinished business. And from your perspective saying, you know, I love you. Thank you. Please forgive me. I forgive you. Let's just, you know, leave in this peaceful fashion. Those are kind of some conversations that one could have um, at, at the time of someone's death. Or do you think at any, I mean, why not have it today? <laughs> like, you know, have it with your parents today. Why do they have to die before you have this conversation with them? See, that that's just it. And that's the beauty of this discussion and this radio show and other radio shows and other movements like Let's Have Dinner and Talk About Death you know, it was a movement that was started by Michael Hebb last year and, you know, the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Foundation partnered on that launch day, mm -hmm. which was the um, in celebration of Elizabeth's passing on August 24th. Right. But that's just it. We don't have to wait. And then when you kind of learn these life lessons, it's illuminating because all of your living relationships shift. Mm -hmm. All of them. Mm -hmm. Not just, you know, the people you like and that are in your home or the people you work with. The people you pass in the grocery store, the people that you see struggling to get out of their car, the people who do stupid mistakes that we all do all the time anyway, our consciousness shifts. Mm -hmm. So it's really, it's an enlightened or I should say um, loving way of being in the earth for the rest of your life. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, you said something, and I heard one of your interviews that I really thought was lovely, that loss and love are the great unifiers. I mean, even just talking to a stranger, you know, someone rushes up to you in the, in the airport to tell you that, you know, they're grieving and they're depressed. <laughs> it's a unifier. It's, it gives us permission to be one with each other, you know, because death is a, is a human experience. We're all going to experience at one point or some type of loss, even if it's a loss of job. Uh, or loss of a marriage or whatever you're going to be experiencing it at one point so I think it is a unifier um, it's interesting Ken tell me about your mom I and mean, what were the conversations that you that she had with you uh, well I, I learned a lesson from my mother um, she had been wanting to die for nine years and all she kept saying was I'm ready to die I'm ready to die I think I'm going to die next week and she's very frustrated and she's very angry about that and about three weeks before she died, she, she turned to me one day and said, I'm not ready to die. Wow. And totally blown away. I couldn't believe it. Like, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross is not ready to die. I mean, like, this is impossible. Like, you know, aliens have abducted my mother. <laughs> and so she didn't explain what she meant. And, you know, within maybe 10 days, she um, kind of went under. We had to put her on morphine. She had an infection. And so she couldn't speak anymore. And I couldn't discuss it with her. Mm. It only took me about two or three years to kind of figure out what happened. But what I believe happened was when she finally let go of her anger and finally was happy with the way she was, with her grandchildren being there, with the place she was living, with me being around the corner, when she finally let go and accepted, that's when she learned her final lesson and was ready to die. And that's when she passed. Wow. So I think that anger about being here and wanting to die kept her from actually dying. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's really amazing to us wow. that, that she, she learned and I learned both. Wait, the anger of not, wait, saying that again, so it was her anger of... The anger of not being able to die on her terms when she wanted to. And when she learned to, 
you know, you can't teach the teacher. Yeah. So when she let go of her anger, and you know, she's always about learning lessons. And when she learned her own lesson, then she was like, wow, that and she is was at a- peace. And so when she was at peace, she finally was able to die. Mm, there's a really um, interesting article. I, I'm sure you read it at the time in the San Francisco Chronicle. This is a long time ago where someone was interviewing your mom. And, and I don't know if this is true or not, but the reporter was saying your mom was questioning the models and looking at that. What do you think she – and I don't know what your mom really said. What, do, you, do you remember that article and what do you think was happening to no, your mom? No, it wasn't true at all. Okay. Total garbage. Yeah, that's irritating. Okay, yeah. that's irritating for me. <laughs> I can't let go of that anger. I'm sorry, I'm stuck in this. Okay, seat. now I'm now I put you in a state of anger. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I'll get over it. <laughs> okay, so um, if you guys would um, indulge all of us, I mean, I, I you've been in the presence of someone um, passing. I I sadly, my dad died of a heart attack. Boom, he was gone, and I just got the phone call. What is it like being with a person who? is upon death. I mean, were you there at the time, Diane, were you there at the time that your son died and what was the experience like and how did it change you? It was beautiful. Um, I've been in, in both circumstances. I've been with somebody who was, uh, two people that were angry that did not want to die. And, um, and they fought it. Oh man, they fought it tooth and nail. I mean, up the last gasp, the last everything, and and it was a difficult passing, not just for them, but also for their family members. Mm. Um, not pretty. I've been with um, another person who didn't have the adv- and he. And this was a dear friend of mine, and he asked me. He said, "You know, Diane, am I going to die?" So somebody my age, you yeah. know, and. And I said, you know, and I responded to him, and he said, but I, I don't want to die. He had a more difficult time early on, but when, to, when he came to accept that death is a part of life, it is, like it or not, it is a part of life, and that his death was his, that was his journey, um, he had a more peaceful passing. In Austin's case, um, Austin had, I could not have scripted it any better. Mm. I mean, of course I did not want my child to die. Of course I would give anything and everything for him to be healthy and here with me and here with me for the last nine years since his death. I mean, life has changed enormously. But with that said, the moment of his death, and I want to share this with people because I hear it all the time, it's not that CSI stuff that you see. You know, and I think my daughter was terrified because that was her, you know, vision. Mommy, do they turn blue? Do they, what do they do? Do they, Mm. it does not have to be that. Yes, some patients have a very um, difficult, physical, laborious death process, but a lot of people don't. Mm. A lot of people, death comes in as a whisper. The last, you know, few hours of life, they, their breathing becomes labored, they, they ease into death gently, and they stop breathing. And that was Austin's case. That child had suffered for so many years so profoundly that the paradoxical nature for him was that his death was as peaceful as his life should have been. Mm. And, um, and, and I have to tell you, it is an extraordinary gift to have... Um, my child died peacefully and as elegantly as I could have ever mm. imagined in my mind's eye. Mm. He simply, the nurse came to the room. She said, I think, it, to, I think it's time. I held one hand. My daughter held the other hand. And Austin he quietly, with a whisper, stopped breathing, and that was and that was it at four sixteen in the morning. You know, wow. And that was after you know I, there was no planned. Okay, I'm going to say the Lord's Prayer and the twenty third Psalm, and, and and I'm going to know exactly what to do. No, it just sort of it's uh, instinctive in each family has his or her own instinctive 
way to be with that. And that was just, that was ours. Mm, that's a beautiful story. That's, wow, thank you for sharing that. And it's very personal, so thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, Ken, what was it like? Were you there at your mother's passing? And what was it like for you? Um, we had some trouble, or I should say maybe I had trouble, because my mother was in a group home, and she kept getting these infections, and um, she was under a sort of hospice care, and yet she wasn't really in hospice, mm -hmm. and I found it very ironic, because I was the one having to make all the medical decisions for my mother's health, mm -hmm. and I was the only non-doctor of my family, so I found it very ironic <laughs> and frustrating, like, why do I have to keep making the decisions? You know, um, based on like what kind of medication my mother would get, pain relief, and so forth. Right. So at one point, my mother's infection became very bad, and um, we were debating what kind of pain medication to give her because you know certain medications, you know, cause you to stop eating right. and basically lead you, you know to eventually die. Right. Which doesn't make them bad. I mean, you know, at a certain point you need them. Yeah. And so it was just that point whether we want to go to that degree of medication, and I wasn't really educated in that. And so I needed help. So I brought in a friend of ours from Vermont who was a nurse who knew my mother. And together we made that decision to put her on certain combination of morphine and other opiates. So you know, after that point, my mom stopped eating and she wasn't conscious. And it went on for about uh, five, six days. And eventually we got to the point where I got a call saying, you know, tonight's the night your mother's going to pass, we can tell. So I went to the group home and my sister and I sat with my mother as she died. And I don't think I'd ever been in the room where anyone had died before. So, you know, it was a new experience for me. I didn't know what to expect. Mm -hmm. But um, obviously I didn't want to see my mother go. But on the other hand, my mother had been frustrated and, you know, it was time. So I was happy that she was able to go peacefully and that I was with her because I was often traveling. So. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a, a good death as defined by my mother to have her children there and to die pain-free and just peacefully slip out. Uh, so it's kind of hard to believe almost, you know, I mean, you know, as Diana knows, uh, you keep expecting the death year after year and it's, you know, it's a little surreal in some ways and a little hard to accept. Yeah. But I, a little uh, kind of peaceful at the same time and closing a chapter that's been frustrating for everybody at, at some point. And what I find so fascinating about the story is that you shared that, you know, one of your mother's anger was not having control of her death. And at the, you know, at the time when she was struggling a mouth, you, you actually had control of her death, right? I mean, it's just a continuation of that, you know, of just waiting, waiting and, and knowing that you don't have control over it, even if it's, you know, when you get the pain medications. Wow, that is, that is uh, again, another beautiful story. Um, Thank you for sharing, because these are, I think that because we are so afraid to talk about death, no one even asks these questions because they're afraid to ask, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what are some other questions that um, these death, death dinner parties, <laughs> what do they look like? What happens during one of these dinner parties? Well, Diane, you share the story about um, Joel's kids? Yeah, it was really interesting. So Ken and I were, happened to both be in Arizona. Um, when we did a dinner party um, and we decided to host our dinner party I hosted one in Florida and one in Arizona and the one in Arizona was at Ken's mom's gravesite Wow! And, yeah uh, on August 24th and we had a few friends there and some friends brought their kids hmm. and they thought it was so cool they were like We've never done anything like this. And it was at the gravesite. We had a fabulous picnic under a big tree. And um, they just, they thought it was the coolest thing. And they didn't see what the big deal was. I mean, Ken, what else do you remember about the kids? Well, I remember the kids have been very afraid of death beforehand. And they yeah. said they were a little, you know, intimidated about coming yeah. to the cemetery. They said, but once they got there, they really got into the spirit of things, and when they got home, they really, you know, they said with their, you know, to their parents that they really have a much better understanding of cemeteries, and they weren't really afraid of death anymore. So yeah. it's a really big breakthrough for those kids. Well, were there certain questions? I know that I, based on what I was reading on the website, it seemed like there's like a, some, you know, there's a setup for this whole party with even supplied questions. Is that right? And how do we find that if we wanted to start those conversations on our own, either within our own families or with other people? 
Well, there, there are great websites. One is the conversationproject.org. Mm -hmm. And so that's a great website because what they do is, and, and I want to be really clear, CJ, about this, is that people fear death, but death is an event. Mm -hmm. So that it's not really what they fear. I think what they fear is end of life and the process. Is it going to hurt? Will I suffer? How long will it take? But mm. death, it, death is the, the event itself. Right, it's, it's the dying that they're afraid of. Exactly. So the Conversation Project talks about, asks people and they have a free downloadable starter kit. And there's a new starter kit coming out soon. But there's um, this starter kit that's up there helps people to have the conversation with their loved ones. Mm -hmm. What's important to you? What about pain? What do you want to be intubated? Do you not want to be intubated? Mm. What is it that you like? That's one website. Another one is um, there's a group called Five. It's so what's it called? It's the one that does the Five Wishes. If you Google Five Wishes, yes, uh -huh. you pull up Five Wishes. And that's also uh, free. It's downloadable. You can get um, it's a uh, a contract or it's a it's an agreement that talks about um, what it is that each person would like uh, at the end of their life. Um, also, too, you can go to deathoverdinner.org, and that's what you were asking about. Yes. So, deathoverdinner.org is fascinating right because it asks people to convene around a table I mean through the ages including Elizabeth you know Elizabeth used to love to cook and she'd get people together for dinner parties and people have been convening around the table for centuries whether the table is six inches off the ground right in some <laughs> cultures yes no table they eat on a dirt floor or they're having a picnic but this convening of people is a great place to have important conversations mm. between friends, between relatives, and those conversations can be anything to, like we started in Florida, ours with a toast, you know, to honor the people that we love that have passed. Mm -hmm. And then it turned into debauchery as one of our friends talked about what she wanted to be buried in. <laughs> <laughs> it does not have to be this morose. Stuff. Yes. Exactly. It can be uh, enlightening. Yeah. No, but it but it also should encompass things that are important to you. What do you want to do? Who's going to take care of whom? How do you want to do this? Yes. Very affirmative, empowering yeah. conversation. But I understand too. The biggest question I always get uh, regarding these death over dinners is, how do I get started? Well, yes. you just start. You just even if it's through a joke or through honoring somebody that yeah. you love. Uh, and I will tell you, CJ, that in India, um, Dr. Rajagopal, who was just honored with a Human Rights Watch Humanitarian Award today, um, hosted a dinner for over 200 people in India mm. because there too, people are not so comfortable talking about death. Mm -hmm. And he he told me he said that eventually. They had to shut it down after two hours because people mm. were so thankful to have the opportunity to talk. And ironically, I just got a message that we have to have, we should have to close. So we'll, before we close, tell us about your website and how people get some more information. So it's uh, ekrfoundation.org. Is that the best place to start? It is. Okay. Uh, www.ekrfoundation.org. Um, and the other you know the other ones we talked about too you can find us on Twitter at Kubler Ross and you can also find us on Facebook um, there's a Kubler Ross friends of and there's also a Elizabeth Kubler Ross uh, author page mm. ironically we've run out of time <laughs> but I thank you the two of you so much for sharing your stories and uh, and, and clarifying some of the myths that we have or misunderstandings thank you so much guys Thank you. Blessings, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. It means so much to me that you're listening to the show. I would love your support in any way by giving me comments below or to subscribe to the show or share the show with friends. Thank you again for your support. Love and blessings.